Hey. Welcome. My name is Susan Burns, and I'm an associate chair here in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And it's my pleasure this morning to welcome you to our Fall 2024 Hyatt Lecture. The Hyatt Lecture series was established in 2015 by the generosity of Kenneth Hyatt, a civil engineering alum. Today we mark the 19th Hyatt Lecture in the school, and it's really our great honor to welcome Dr. Gretchen Goldman. Dr. Goldman is the Climate Change Research and Technology Director at the U.S. Department of Transportation, where she also serves as the co-director of the DOT Climate Change Center. Dr. Goldman earned her BS in Atmospheric Sciences from Cornell University. She then saw the light and came to Georgia Tech, where she earned her MS and PhD in Environmental Engineering. Dr. Goldman has a list of accolades that is amazing and long, and I'd take the whole hour if I read them all to you. But I want to highlight a few things. In particular, during her time as a student here at Georgia Tech, she was named the Outstanding Environmental Engineering PhD student in 2011. The Atlanta Bicycle Coalition named her Advocate of the Year. She served as the chair of the Bicycle Infrastructure Improvement Committee here at Tech. And she also served as an SGA graduate senator. And finally, she served as president for our Association of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. So clearly, she has passion and dedication for service. Uh, during her career, Dr. Uh, Goldman has also served in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, where she's led federal efforts on scientific integrity, indigenous knowledge, climate and equity, air quality, and environmental justice. Finally, she's also served as a decade for, as the research director for the Center for Science and Democracy at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Here she, she led research and policy efforts on climate, environmental and science policy decision making. So as I reflected on Dr. Goldman's career, it's quite remarkable, especially given such a short span of time in which she's been working. She's clearly demonstrated the ability to combine exceptional research skills with a passion and dedication for service. And she's made exceptional and substantial impact in what is arguably the most dire and critical problem that we're facing today. So it's with great pleasure that I invite you to join me in welcoming Dr. Goldman. So much, Susan, and thank you all for being here. Uh, this is really special to me to be able to uh, give this lecture uh, because uh, my time at Georgia Tech was uh, really special to me, and I, I think it shaped who I am in lots of ways in terms of honing my skills and instilling my values and uh, setting me on a trajectory to do uh, more. And uh, so um, I, by the time I graduated, I had a pretty clear idea of what I wanted to do, how I wanted to affect change in different ways. Uh, and, but I didn't know exactly how I would get there or what I would do uh, next. So I gave uh, the uh, reflection speech when I graduated, uh, which I will not subject you to. <laughs> um, but to summarize that in uh, that speech, I talked about uh, solving big problems, serving communities, and leaving places better than you found them. And uh, I knew a little bit about uh, why I wanted to do these things and how I would do these things uh, from my time at Georgia Tech and the experiences that I had both in and outside of the classroom. And uh, I wanted to have that as be the message when I, when I left and think forward. And then uh, since I left, I've, I've had a lot more experiences where I worked on these things uh, in the real world beyond my, my time as a student. And so in reflecting on what I wanted to say today, I thought about what I would have wanted to tell myself at this moment and when I was leaving tech and, and choosing what to do next in the world. And so uh, for uh, the duration of this talk, uh, I wanted to focus on these things and what I would tell myself. And so uh, this talk is 
the Gretchen's Guide to Solving Big Problems, Serving Communities, and Leaving Places Better Than You Found Them. So, uh, and I'm going to do that by reflecting on uh, some of what I did at, at Georgia Tech to uh, accomplish these things, and, and then what I've done since then that uh, showed me how to do those things. Uh, so. Um, in terms of a quick uh, pictorial biography, which uh, Susan covered uh, to some extent, um, so I uh, graduated with a PhD in environmental engineering uh, from here, and I knew I wanted to do something applied, something that sort of took my technical skills and did uh, something in policy or communications or sort of advocacy realms. And so uh, I moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, without a job and uh, started to that down that pathway. Uh, I got a position at the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is a nonprofit science policy advocacy group uh, that does analysis and communication and advocacy on a variety of science policy topics uh, from climate to agriculture to vehicles and uh, several areas. Um, and I, I stayed there for a decade and uh, did a lot of uh, policy aligned research and communications and mobilizing the scientific community uh, and otherwise uh, looking to move the needle on issues that had a big science or technical component um, but had opportunities to, to move in the policy sphere. Um, a lot of this was uh, federal policy focused work but also some oriented towards working with communities directly um, that took me towards uh, doing all kinds of research, working with the scientific community in different ways on different issues. I testified to Congress. I did a lot of talking with uh, journalists, talking to media, talking to um, decision makers and in different parts of government. Um, and then in uh, 2021, I had the opportunity to do a lot of that same kind of work uh, from the other side and doing it uh, from within uh, the White House. So I uh, went into uh, the Biden-Harris administration's Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House to do a lot of uh, similar topics, but uh, from, do them from inside government. Uh, there I was the assistant director for environmental science, engineering, policy, and justice, and covered uh, climate and environmental justice, scientific integrity, indigenous knowledge, um, and a few other areas uh, there. Uh, I did that for almost uh, two years. Uh, and then when my term was up in the White House, I decided to uh, stay in government because uh, it just felt like such a big opportunity to really move, especially on climate um, in this moment, uh, given uh, the opportunities that exist at the federal level. Uh, so I took a position as a climate change research and technology director at the U.S. Department of Transportation, uh, where I'm covering all things climate and transportation, both in terms of uh, decarbonizing the transportation sector, uh, as well as building more um, transportation infrastructure that's resilient to uh, climate change impacts. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk through some of these experiences as I as I go through uh, the guide. So uh, lesson one in uh, the guide is uh, to imagine and work towards a better world, even if you can't yet see the pathway. So at Georgia Tech, uh, I did a lot of bike advocacy, and um, this was uh, largely a sort of new enterprise. We were trying to sort of build a community around biking on campus, which uh, didn't exist in the, in the way that it does now. And so we had a small group of us that would try to uh, build out this space. Uh, we uh, successfully uh, got facilities to build us this little cage at the bottom of the CRC parking deck uh, to work on bikes. And uh, the goal was to get more access to bikes for students who wanted bikes and to teach them how to work on bikes and, um, and do that and then also improve uh, infrastructure on campus, try to get more bike racks, bike lanes, you know, and ways to, to make it safer and easier to bike on campus. And um, so I did that for my duration here, uh, but it was it was pretty slow going. Uh, by the time I graduated, we had um, we had successfully gotten a couple uh, racks put on campus and we had uh, gotten them um, to put in some bike sharrows, so just the paint on the sidewalk. And um, that felt very uh, accomplished at the time. And and uh, I felt I was so proud of the, of the, the paint on the uh, um, sidewalk, I even when I graduated, I took a photo with the Shero because it was such a that, this little paint on the sidewalk. Um, but now, if you go around campus, right, this is uh, 
probably small. Well, because uh, you all, I took this photo yesterday, have built, are building lots and lots of bike infrastructure all over campus. And it's so much more than I ever could have imagined when I was a student. And so um, I, th I thought this was a great example of just how much progress uh, you can make if you start down a path, even if it's not clear how you're going to get there um, long term. Uh, and so uh, later in my career, I also learned uh, this lesson in big ways. So uh, I want to start with a story about uh, the Air Quality Public Health Act of 2020, uh, which you have likely never heard of because it did not pass. Uh, it did not get passed into a law. Um, but this was a, a bill that was proposed uh, that I worked on when I was at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, and what it would do was uh, specifically help to address uh, environmental justices and who is exposed to air pollution. Uh, so one, um, uh, I did a lot of environmental justice advocacy at that time, was working with uh, communities that were disproportionately impacted by air pollution uh, and thinking about how to better improve their situation. Um, and one big challenge with uh, dealing with uh, environmental injustices like that is uh, the way that our air quality policies work at the federal level is not really designed to protect uh, individual communities, especially those that are disproportionately impacted um, because of where we put the monitors, because of how that feeds into uh, regulations at the federal level. And so there's really this sort of mix mismatch of uh, what the policies are able to do, just given the laws that we have, uh, and what, actually, what protects communities, especially communities that are at the fence line of a major industrial facility or otherwise sort of have a higher load of pollution exposure. Uh, and so what this act would have done is it would have required the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to deploy fence line monitoring, so do more of that monitoring right where we know there's more pollution happening. Uh, and importantly, it would have integrated that those monitors and the data you get from that uh, from those monitors at the fence lines into national emission standards. So this was the missing piece because it could link to directly to policy outcomes for those communities. And it did that within the context of the Clean Air Act, but added those new authorities to it. And, um, and it would allow a lot more air quality sensors uh, within communities so we could really get a better handle on the people that are most impacted from air quality uh, problems. How are, they going, how are we going to improve that situation? Um, so this was a bill we were working on. We were thinking through all the details. We sort of helping uh, develop what should this look like and what's the pathway by which you would be able to um, really tackle this and, and get better uh, context for this. Um, but uh, the bill didn't pass at the time. And uh, so it was really just to sort of build out the idea to sort of figure out what the policy pathway could be. But we didn't know how it was going to get passed at the time. Uh, but then, uh, as you might uh, recall, uh, one thing that happened that was a huge historic moment recently was uh, the Inflation Reduction Act passed. So when I was in the White House, uh, this large uh, legislation uh, passed, um, and this represented uh, the largest climate investment in history. And so this really has been this game-changing uh, opportunity that has put the U.S. on a trajectory to address uh, climate change in ways that would have been unimaginable a few years prior. Um, so this has invested um, billions of dollars in different parts of climate and clean energy uh, efforts at the, at the federal level and really given us an opportunity to meet our, our climate goals and uh, get to um, get to net zero by 2050. So this is a really big deal. And this uh, came and uh, has been a big deal in all kinds of areas. Uh, but one thing that it also did, because uh, anyone who sort of followed this might recall that uh, the Inflation Reduction Act was sort of, um, it kind of happened all of a sudden. There was sort of, uh, it, it happened in the background of the, on the Hill. They sort of kept quiet about how they were doing it. And so there wasn't a lot of uh, transparency in the public about how, what was in or out and how they were sort of getting it done. Uh, but one thing that made it into the Inflation Reduction Act was that Air Quality and Public Health Act of 2020. And so all those things that we worked on, that it wasn't clear what the pathway would be uh, to, to getting it passed into law, um, are now in law because of the Inflation Reduction Act and because that was able to happen. And the only reason we could do that was because we took the time to develop out that policy idea so it was ready to go 
when the Inflation Act, uh, Reduction Act was moving. Um, and so now that, that effort is underway and the US Environmental Protection Agency is working on those, those elements to try to improve air quality uh, in environmental justice communities. So, uh, so that, that has been um, a really uh, important victory and what's a much bigger victory of, of getting this uh, climate and clean energy investments uh, through. And then uh, that's joined by uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law that passed a little before that. And that, that's been a once in a generation investment in our nation's infrastructure. Uh, and it's included uh, historic investments in US manufacturing uh, efforts. And so altogether, uh, these represent uh, huge unprecedented investments that can build us this clean energy future that uh, we never could have imagined or I couldn't have imagined uh, before uh, this, before a few years ago. So, um, so we're now in a really different context as far as advancing climate change efforts and advancing clean energy um, in ways that can really um, move the United States in, in much bigger ways. Um, and then just to throw in my little pocket of this, so this is sort of mobilized all kinds of programs across the federal government, in lots of different ways, uh, lots of exciting work happening. Um, just to give you one sampling of, of what that looks like, this is what it looks like in my world at the Department of Transportation. So I'm uh, launching a brand new uh, climate research and technology program. So this is uh, for the first time in the Secretary's office at DOT. Uh, there's a research program focused on climate change. Um, and we've been able to do a lot of uh, work from doing external research investments to doing sort of applied analytics that sort of feed into uh, policy and decision making at different levels of government on transportation and climate. Um, and it allowed us to really be able to work with the policy and, and get a lot done. And so um, there's things like this happening all across the government in, in big ways because of those legislative successes. All right, so that was lesson one. Uh, imagine and work towards a better world even if you can't yet see the pathway. So lesson two. Uh, is don't underestimate your knowledge or skills. So I wanted to include this one because when I think back about my time at Georgia Tech and in school, one thing that, that comes to mind is that I think it is easy to underestimate what you know because in your in academic settings and when you're in an academically rigorous place like Georgia Tech, you're just very hyper aware of all the things you don't know because you're being tested on it. You're being asked that as a grad student. Yeah, I was being, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to focus on the things you don't know because that's sort of the point, right? You want to um, push the bounds of, of knowledge and research. And I think it just one element of that is that it makes it harder to sort of remember all the things that you do know and all the skills that you have and all the things that uh, are really valuable and contributions that you can make, uh, even if um, they're not necessarily uh, valued or recognized in the same way in this specific academic setting. Um, and so for me, one way that this came up is uh, I always, uh, I always felt like I uh, wasn't a good technical speaker. I wasn't very, uh, the way that I write and talked was more casual and sort of layman. And so I was always sort of self-conscious about that when I was in um, academic settings at conferences and, and everything because it didn't seem like a serious scientist, right? The way they would talk. Um, but then when I moved to DC and I got into a lot of uh, science policy spaces where I was talking about technical topics uh, to different audiences and policy, policy and decision makers, uh, it became this incredible asset to be able to talk like a human to people on technical topics uh, in ways that uh, they could understand. And um, I, I it, tur it turned out that uh, that, that uh, served me um, well in a few cases uh, that I wanted to highlight. So, um, so one part of my job was uh, when I was at Union of Concerned Scientists and a little bit since was translating of uh, actions in the news that were technical and translate what it would mean, what are the impacts of this move or this thing that suddenly happened in a policy context, what does it mean for the average person and what are the consequences? Uh, and so I did a lot of uh, talking to the media, explaining things to the public or explaining uh, to decision makers what that looked like. And um, this one time, uh, this uh, event happened, so there was a move um, to uh, 
uh, kill this uh, air quality committee. And uh, I realized I was sort of uniquely positioned to explain what this was. So I, I did air quality um, time attack, and I had been in the, the policy realm for a few uh, years. And so uh, I thought, OK, I can explain you know, what this means. Um, but this happened. It was like 5 p.m. It was like late in the news cycle and the way that the, the news um, covers. And I thought, oh, I got to get something else quick. Uh, my kids were already home. I couldn't like write a giant, you know, post where I explained it. And, you know, great. Okay, well, I'll just, I'll just go on Twitter and kind of talk about what it is. And so uh, I, I did. And, um, you know, I just started writing, you know, well, this is pretty bad. And I <laughs> talked through what it would be. Um, and, uh, and then uh, they ended up actually pulling those tweets into the New York Times article that was about this because, uh, because I was the first person to uh, coherently explain what it was and what the impact was. And they needed someone to be able to explain it really quick. Um, and so I thought that was a good example because, you know, of course, if I, if I submitted a paper to a scientific journal and I just wrote, this is bad, period, I'm pretty sure that would not be uh, looked on positively. But uh, in this context, it was uh, helpful to, to talk like that. Um, and then uh, another quick example on that sort of uh, general front um, I wanted to cover is uh, I did a lot of um, on-air uh, communications with the media in that same way to sort of explain news that is happening in real time. Uh, and so uh, in 2020, one day, I did this interview uh, on um, CNN, CNN's uh, Wolf Blitzer's show, This Situation Room. And uh, the way these come in, they kind of say, OK, this just happened. Can you go on air? And, 45 minutes and, and talk about it and you know I say okay and uh, but it was it was 2020 so everyone was working from home and my kids were home and everything and uh, so I just set up this space in my living room to look you know vaguely professional and uh, uh, but uh, the reality of the the room I was in at that time uh, looked like so um, so you know I'm wearing shorts like I, I had to, to get the camera uh, you know I chair and uh, there's of course toys over and uh, and uh, you know the the contrast was sort of funny and I, I thought okay well you know I'll just um, I'll just tell people and be honest about like what I what my situation is so I I, I tweeted out this photo and um, and uh, it immediately went viral <laughs> so. Uh, this tweet has now been seen by 25 million people worldwide, uh, and uh, I was immediately thrown into this giant uh, media frenzy of being called by reporters and being asked to talk about the plight of working parents and the pandemic and what that sort of means. And, um, and uh, so I had this sort of uh, 36 hours of extreme fame uh, that came out of this. So, uh, but you know, it was really like a, a, an, an opportunity, right? You educate people about the issue. I have an opportunity to sort of talk about the real challenges that did exist for parents and caregivers during the pandemic. And so, uh, really, just was kind of um, this notable moment. And um, I learned a lot of things when 25 million people see a photo of your house, you get a lot of feedback about <laughs> everything in the photo and everybody figured out all kinds of things about my life. Based on that photo. Uh, so. Okay, uh, so that was uh, don't underestimate your knowledge and your skills. All right, lesson three is uh, to take the time to understand the real world context of your work. Um, so one thing that uh, I think is true here and is true in, in lots of academic settings is um, you tend to be really focused on the academic portion, on the piece that's going to be on the test, right? What is the sort of technical element of uh, what you're doing? Um, and that can sometimes be detached from how those concepts, how those topics are covered when you get outside of the classroom. Um, so one thing that I did that I felt uh, really shaped my perspective on the world and really allowed me to do uh, things beyond tech is uh, think about the concepts I learned in the classroom and how those related to uh, how they were dealt with in the real world outside of the classroom and other spaces. Uh, and so I was in environmental engineering and uh, I got really interested in environmental advocacy in different ways. Uh, I did a lot with uh, the student groups on campus that focused on environmental advocacy and um, that really allowed for a lot of opportunity because uh, we're, we're in Atlanta, we're in the capital, I would go to the, the, the state capital sometimes and uh, work on policy efforts there and um, could do some different efforts on campus to try to 
to um, get a sense of sort of how those technical concepts uh, played out in, um, in the real world. And one time, one thing that was really pivotal for me on this front is uh, one time I went to go uh, watch a court case in downtown Atlanta. There was um, a legal battle over a permit for a coal-fired power plant they were going to build in South Georgia, and uh, you could go. You could just go and sort of watch them um, litigate it. And uh, so I went, and I uh, listened to it, and they were arguing over, you know, the modeling of the air pollution and what sort of, you know, whether or not they had sort of adequately accounted for uh, the pollution levels that would result from um, putting this, this power plant there. And uh, I listened to them talk about my science. They were talking about the thing I was working on at Georgia Tech in, in um, my research group, but they were talking about it entirely differently than the way that we would have talked about it in the lab group. And the things that were important were totally different than what, what we would have said in a scientific context of how you would sort of talk about what the elements were that were important and what the uncertainties were. Um, and it made me realize that it, things are just so different in different spaces and the way that things are understood and the way that information, technical information is used when you get outside of academic environments um, can be really different. And, and so there's this critical need for someone to be able to translate those and to make sure those are aligned and that we're translating that information in a way that is most useful to make the best, most science-based decisions on things. Um, so that was one thing that was really impactful for me personally. And, um, and that really allowed for um, setting me on this path to do uh, science policy efforts because uh, I could really think about, okay, well, this is how it is understood in a uh, technical context, how it's understood in the scientific context. But here's what it the policy decisions and investments and the way that we think about it in, in the world. And so uh, that's really something that I, I would uh, recommend thinking about as you're, as you're here, because you will never again, well, maybe you will, but right now you have a tremendous amount of access to uh, really smart people that can help you understand how all of the technical work feeds into the world. And so you can act, you can really get that access to information to sort of understand things um, with uh, the professors and everyone around you that has this expertise. Um, and so really take advantage of that because I, I felt like that was just um, super useful to be able to sort of understand um, how things operate and, and um, allow you to be effective no matter which field you go into. Okay, so let's take the time to understand the real world context of your work. And lesson four is uh, to solve big problems, we need to change systems. Uh, so um, this is uh, me and my friend Liam Ratre when we were students and uh, we were uh, starting uh, Students Organizing for Sustainability, which I think is still in existence uh, now on campus. Um, and uh, we were trying to do um, build out sort of a sustainability uh, focus uh, organization at Georgia Tech and really push what are the, some of the sustainable practices that were happening on campus. And um, we had made some, I thought we had made some progress on that. We had sort of, we had a little community garden plot. We had sort of a community supported agriculture program. We had sort of um, done a lot of lectures uh, and talks and sort of just built up a constituency on campus. And then uh, one day, uh, Liam said, well, we, yeah, we've done a lot of things, but, you know, we've really only added new things. We haven't really changed the status quo. So in order to actually change the system and how things work and what sort of make sure that it's a, a sustainable long-term change on something, you really need to change how things operate, how they happen. And it isn't just that you, you can't just add new things, right? Because that could be fleeting if it's more dependent on someone continuing those new things or you know, the people behind it to do that. Um, and so that really took that to heart in thinking about the, uh, what you need to change. If you really want to affect change in the world and you want that change to be lasting, 
you have to change it within a system and, and you can't just add new things to it or add alternative options for it. And so um, I've really tried to apply that in a lot of the work that I've done since then. Uh, and one area where that came up in a really big way in my career is around uh, this concept of scientific integrity. So um, this is uh, a topic I've worked on. Uh, my, so my first job, my first title, I was a scientific integrity analyst. That was my, my um, first job out. And uh, so scientific integrity, is uh, integrity in the way that we conduct, use, and communicate science in different policy decision contexts. So it means making sure that we protect the science and scientists that are communicating that there's not uh, interference in the science or technical information for political purposes, right? So uh, if you are a decision maker and you want uh, science to be on your side, you can't change the number to get the answer you want, right? That would be bad. So uh, that is um, the basic premise of scientific integrity. And so um, I worked on a lot of issues and thinking about how do we better protect science and scientists at the federal level. Um, and this is, uh, it it's not uh, partisan inherently, it's more just that you know, it's really helpful when you're trying to make an argument to have science on your side to be able to use a scientific argument and that makes it really vulnerable from all, from many sides to uh, being tampered with or suppressed or uh, silencing the scientists. And, and this happened, uh, this happens uh, his, and historically in lots of ways. Uh, and so my first job was sort of building the case for documenting this happening, sort of defining scientific integrity and what it, what it was, and then helping to, to figure out what to do with it. And so um, over the years that I was at Union of Concerned Scientists, we did a lot of uh, documenting uh, problems, so times this sort of came up in federal context, ways that uh, data or science was uh, misused or sidelined in different ways. Um, we, so we had to make the case that it was an issue. Um, and then we had to start to try to build solutions, say, well, how would you address that? What would you do differently to try to better protect uh, science and scientists in uh, federal decision-making context. Um, and then uh, we tried to work to get these changes in into policy and practices at federal agencies and, uh, and uh, Congress. Um, and so uh, by the time this current administration started, uh, we had this opportunity to do this in a bigger way because we had taken the time to build out all the solutions, to really document what this means, to find the scope and, and come up with what could we really do about um, this general problem. Uh, and uh, so this is a piece we wrote in Science Magazine um, to say, well, here's, here's what we think we need to do about this and how we can sort of improve it. Um, and uh, science always does these uh, really dramatic photos. So uh, I don't know if that's really what, what, it, what I would say was happening, but you know, they took it very seriously. <laughs> so uh, this is um, an effort that uh, we pushed on. And so then um, uh, in the Biden-Harris administration, uh, they took this on in a big way. And uh, the White House uh, issued in the very first week of the administration uh, a memorandum on scientific integrity to try to address this problem. And it laid out steps that uh, would uh, start to advance that work. Um, uh, uh, myself and others were uh, brought in to help carry this out and uh, work on this further. And we had a team of people from across uh, federal agencies to figure out what this should look like um, within government. And, uh, and then uh, we did a big report to document uh, the challenges and, and what sort of that looked like and should look like at the federal level. Uh, and then in 2023, we released the framework that sort of set the direction of here's what agencies need to do to uh, set up uh, this process. Um, and then uh, we just released uh, last month a report to uh, talk more about the status and really get a lot of these efforts um, in place at the federal level across the government. Um, and so now uh, we have uh, 19 federal agencies have uh, new final scientific integrity policies um, these include all of the uh, wish list that uh, we in the White House wanted them to include that uh, protect science, protect the scientists, um, have really detailed provisions about what is and isn't allowed under this framework to um, make sure that the science isn't politicized uh, in different contexts. And so uh, all of these agencies having uh, policies in place and scientific integrity officers in place that each have uh, a human, at least one human, is at the place to protect the integrity of 
all the science uh, and scientists that uh, are covered at that agency. Um, and so this has really allowed for um, a lot of progress across the government. And this is, um, equates to thousands and thousands of uh, scientists in the government that are working that, are, that now have this new safeguard. Um, and we've also now been working on integrating this in a lot of different ways. Um, if you go to science.gov, there's that scientific integrity uh, section. So it's sort of built into the uh, federal system as it relates to science. Uh, and uh, we have more policies at more agencies coming. And uh, uh, we're now working on getting it really integrated and implemented at agencies where uh, People will be trained on it. There'll be various uh, communications around it. And there's a whole infrastructure within agencies that involves committees and um, ensuring that people have the tools they need to carry out the scientific integrity um, process. And so all this amounts to uh, really uh, changing the system, right? Making sure that we have things embedded within the agency policy, within the agency culture, uh, and within uh, all of the daily work that everyone doing and so it really can help provide a bigger safeguard than ever it has been available before at the federal level to make sure that science and scientists um, can do their work can thrive and without fear of uh, politicization of that so um, that has been um, a really Im impressive accomplishment to be able to do and we've um, worked toward that a lot and then uh, lastly I just wanted to throw in from yesterday that you too are changing the system on a lot of this. Uh, I, I got to go uh, to the Condetta building and um, that of course has uh, a way more, uh, a way bigger garden and way more uh, agricultural uh, opportunities than, than ever were here when I was a student. And I learned that um, it's also pushing the bounds of um, permitting and standards and, and what the building codes are and how you can sort of really push what's possible to do in a building on campus. Um, and that's sort of a, a hard work to try to get that to change and um, at the city or state level, but uh, that's really, um, you all are doing that system change too and sort of pushing the bounds of how we think about sustainability and what can we do in, in bigger and better ways. Um, so I thought that was neat to, to uh, see. Okay, so that's uh, to solve big problems, we need to change systems. Okay, last one. All right, so uh, do the hard work of listening, learning, and experiencing discomfort on hard topics. So uh, one way that I think this is, uh, Georgia Tech is a really great place to sort of learn about these challenges. So uh, one thing that I really worked on is uh, thinking about um, inequities, injustices, and working through how do we really fix uh, inequities at, at the sort of societal level and then um, particularly with respect to environmental justice where um, I had a lot of experience and um, I felt like being at Georgia Tech and being able to learn from the diversity of people and perspectives and issues that exist in uh, in Atlanta at large and in, at Georgia Tech is really this unique opportunity um, and so I would definitely um, encourage you to take advantage of that and really do a lot of engagement with uh, um, whoever you can on, and to really get a sense of, of how things work and what your role is in particular. Um, this is uh, my research group from Georgia Tech. At, uh, we all went to a, a conference in Bogota, Colombia a few years ago. And um, one thing that just struck me is our research group was uh, incredibly diverse. And, and so I got to work closely and um, work from and be friends with lots of people from all over the world. And it's really this education that you can't get everywhere to really yeah, this, all these different perspectives and really learn from different people and live and work closely with people from lots of different backgrounds. Um, and, uh, and the diversity of Atlanta, too, just adds to that huge opportunity to learn from a lot of different um, contexts. And, you know, I found that was really valuable for me personally to think about, well, what is my role given where I am, given the privileges and the background that I come from? You know, what does that mean for me uh, to do this work and, and think about this in, in my career? Um, and so one way that I found was an opportunity to do that was uh, through looking at uh, environmental justice and uh, particularly around disproportionate impacts of air pollution um, on communities. Um, and so this is... Um, as you might be aware, it's a, it's a fairly big problem. There's lots of communities across the country that have very disproportionately higher um, air pollution. It tends to be uh, low-income communities. It 
Um, and as I noted, the, the policy infrastructure is not great at addressing this problem. And so it, it's persisted for years and years, um, both because of systemic racism and, and structural context and inequities um, that are bigger than air quality, but um, also because of what, what we sort of have access to. And so, so one opportunity that I found was uh, a good uh, way to play, take uh, my role in this was to um, work, uh, be a, a scientist, and do sort of analytics that could be in support of what uh, communities were trying to advocate for. Um, so because of uh, power dynamics, because of uh, lots of structural context, um, it can be helpful for them to have uh, a scientist and science be able to hold up and say, this is, this is what's happening, and here's the data, here's the evidence. Demonstrate that. Um, and so often what I was doing was um, just being say that to show them the, the science for it, because um, uh, these communities often, you know, they knew more about, about all the air pollution and chemicals that uh, that I was talking about. They already knew that they had these disproportionate impacts, um, but to have uh, a scientist come in and support that and uh, do academic papers and work through sort of building the case for it on the technical side um, was really helpful in terms of um, them making the case to get improvements and uh, get improved air quality in their community. Um, and so. Um, uh, I did that work from outside government for a little while. And then um, in this administration, there's also been a huge effort to advance environmental justice. Uh, the Biden-Harris administration has done uh, way more on environmental justice than has ever uh, happened at the federal level and certainly at the, at the White House level. Um, and so from the first week, there's been a big effort to uh, prioritize environmental justice and addressing that and leveraging uh, the federal government and all the federal resources that come with that uh, to get resources to uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, the Justice 40 initiative is the, the flagship program that they have, and that's uh, specifically looking at trying to get at least 40% of all the climate and clean energy investments under this administration uh, to go to disadvantaged communities. Um, and so it's really looking to make sure that those who are uh, most affected, who need it the most, sort of get the resources and the benefits of a lot of the investments we're making now. So um, this has been a huge effort that's covering hundreds of programs across the federal government and um, lots of dollars attached to that. Um, and then uh, later in the administration, while I was in the White House, uh, there was a second executive order, and this was uh, to do more on environmental justice and take uh, some uh, bigger steps on that. Um, and so uh, thinking back to what uh, my role was in uh, when I was outside government and thinking about what is the role that science and uh, technical information can play in these efforts, uh, when I came into the White House, the, the first executive order and some of the existing programs uh, didn't have a huge role science or technical efforts. It wasn't um, leveraging uh, the full uh, federal research enterprise, which, um, which is vast, right? Across federal agencies, there's all kinds of big research programs um, that you probably uh, know about or at least have heard about some of them. I mean, you know, NASA and National Science Foundation and NOAA and all, all kinds of places, there's lots of uh, research dollars. And I thought, well, we could be doing more to make sure that all those, all those resources, to the extent they can, are being leveraged to address environmental injustices that were thinking about that top of mind when we're making uh, research decisions. Um, and so uh, I was really excited to get into this executive order, this role of federal science data and research uh, in um, decision making. And so thinking about bringing in explicitly, bringing in that science piece um, and making sure that we are thinking about that and what it can contribute to advancing environmental justice at the federal level. Um, and so in this part of the executive order, in section five, uh, there was this effort to uh, look at what are the gaps in science data and research related to environmental justice and how can we start to think about where that, what contributions uh, science can make to thinking about environmental justice efforts. Um, and so uh, that launched a whole process at the White House Science Office. And, um, uh, this past uh, summer, we were able to release this environmental justice science data and research plan to lay out the roadmap for what should this look like across federal agencies, what kinds of things should researchers be doing to better work with communities, to better uh, focus on looking at inequities in uh, environmental exposure, to look at uh, cumulative impacts, to look at you know what is the sum total of pollution and other factors and stressors that uh, people are exposed 
close to. And so um, this is really looking to move the needle and, and do a lot further um, on, on this topic and what science can bring to that effort. Um, so now this is uh, in implementation phase, so across the government, uh, we're working towards to, uh, putting this into practice in uh, the research parts of federal agency um, everywhere. Um, and so one last um, piece on the uh, thinking about this is um, another uh, example of, of something I did uh, in the White House that um, was really impactful and sort of thinking about addressing inequities was around uh, uh, building out government-wide guidance on indigenous knowledge. So um, because of uh, the pace at which uh, things happen at the White House and sort of how uh, how structurally things can happen and who does what, um, I was tasked with uh, leading this effort to get uh, government-wide guidance on Indigenous knowledge. Um, I'm not an Indigenous person, and so I thought really hard about, well, what should that look like? How do I handle this in a way that's respectful to this community that I'm not a part of? And how do I think about um, doing this the right way in a way that sort of recognizes and centers Indigenous perspectives and people that are the real experts um, on this topic? And and having to do that all in a timeline consistent with uh, the policy environment, which of course is very uh, restrictive and, and faster paced than um, what you might ideally want. Um, and so uh, we, uh, I formed a committee. So we had a big committee that included um, a lot of people that were experts on this topic. And uh, I worked with them um, to build out this guidance. And we uh, talked with tribal leaders. And we I built into the process trying to really ensure there was a lot of um, engagement and input and uh, deference to uh, perspectives of the experts on that. Um, and we were able at the White House Tribal Nations Summit a few years ago to release this guidance. And um, this is the first time that there's ever been a White House recognition of indigenous knowledge as a concept. And so um, this has been uh, really um, a bigger step. And, and we're now sort of uh, implementing that that guidance across the government, um, and we were able to uh, talk about it on the international stage a few years ago at the um, UNFCCC Conference of the Parties, the uh, COP27 on climate change, um, a few years ago to really talk about what does it mean in terms of thinking about indigenous knowledge along with uh, Western academic science when we're thinking about uh, climate and other kinds of policies. And so um, this has really been uh, groundbreaking, groundbreaking and a, a lot of opportunity to do more. And so now uh, we're working through figuring out what, what does that look like um, in within individual programs and, and policies across the government and uh, keeping, trying to keep it going in, in lots of bigger ways, um, given it's new and it needs to be uh, figured out how to do it at all the places that it touches in federal policy. All right, so let's do the hard work of listening, learning, and experiencing discomfort on hard topics. Um, so when I think back about uh, all of my time at tech and everything I've done since. I'm uh, really grateful for all the time that I had here in and out of the classroom to learn a lot of these concepts and really um, set me up to do uh, a lot more when I when I left. And so I hope you really take the opportunity and uh, seize the, the moment to be here and learn and expose yourself to all kinds of uh, perspectives and learnings and ask questions and, and get involved in things um, because it's such a tremendous, unique moment and opportunity to need to be uh, a student and think about all of these efforts when you're in a, a really great place like Georgia Tech where you can do that. Um, and I hope you carry those lessons forward when you go out into the world, uh, whether it's um, in Atlanta or beyond next. And um, I hope that uh, one day you have an opportunity to uh, do everything you can to leave a place better than you found it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goldman, uh, for your inspiring uh, presentation. And we really appreciate your valuable time, valuable information that you share with us. And now we are in the Q&A section. So if you have any question, feel free to raise your hands. <laughs> Uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Terrific. Um, as uh, 
scientist type on this side, I've uh, one of the challenges I face is that science is by its nature tentative. You know, we have hypotheses, they don't work out. We have new knowledge, it changes what we thought we knew. Um, and you mentioned the difference in timelines between uh, <laughs> government or policymakers and research. Um, and, you know, all of our studies, we're supposed to put the limitations and, you know, they all have flaws. So that confronts and is in some ways at odds with the need for certainty on the part of policymakers. They don't they have the luxury of being wrong. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, just one vignette to illustrate, I was in a meeting involving some policymakers in California years ago, and one of them said, we know what we need to do, we just now need the evidence base to, you know, support it. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, well, if we don't have the evidence base to support it, how do we know that's what we need to do? But at the same time, I recognize that, you know, we don't have the luxury of waiting till we know everything. And so I'm just curious how you thread that needle or what your thoughts are on that um, dilemma, if you will. It's a really good question. That, that's sort of the fundamental friction of, of being in this space. And so uh, one, one way that I think about it is that it's, it, it, the relevant question is different when you're in an academic setting than when you are in the policy setting. So you know, here, right, you want to know, you know, how certain are you this is true, and what can we say, and what are all the caveats about why that might not be true, and so the relevant question is more focused on that certainty, and um, in the policy realm, it's just very different dynamics, because like you said, it's either some situation where the train is moving, whether you're there or not, and so it is probably in our interest as technical experts to make sure that it includes the, the evidence of the technical knowledge to the extent we know it at this moment. Um, and so uh, it's often, um, and, and it's not, you, you often just want to say what you can say because there's usually, the, yeah, the opportunities are quicker, right? They have to make, they have limited information and you need to make a decision. And so it's, it's just what can we say? What do we know about what gets to uh, the solution? And um, yeah, and so it, it just is, an, it's often just a really different context. And so one way that I've always thought about it is, well, what is the alternative, right? If I don't, if this reporter calls me and wants to know what I can say about a topic and I say, oh, I don't feel ready to talk about that. You know, we don't really have certainty. I don't want to overstate it and I don't take it. You know, what happens, right? Either there's just no science perspective in that story because nobody was willing to talk on the record about it. And then that feeds into decision making and there's no science feeding into it. Or, um, you know, or they, they call someone else who's not at all concerned with whether or not they're being uh, over uh, cautious about uh, the science, right? So if you, there's lots of cases where uh, I, th I think you, we, we as the technical experts need to communicate what are we able to say at this time? And then they can, you don't, you don't need to feel the burden of, you know, I'm making this investment because of uh, this less than certain science, because often, you know, they'll sort of do the calculation of how to think about uh, what to base it on. Um, but yeah, I think that is there. And I, I mean, one thing in the policy realm, I feel like I kind of had to unlearn being... Um, being uh, really, uh, you know, just being really on the cautious side about that, right? Because in the academic setting, right, you'd never really talk about anything publicly until you were very certain about it, right? Like, but by the time you're giving a presentation at a scientific conference, right, as a student, I mean, you almost, by the time I was talking about anything, I was almost sick of it as a student, right? Because you're just, you're, um, you're really focused on it. You don't talk about anything unless you really, really know it, right? Um, but it's just, it's just a very different context. And I, I think it goes back to knowing what you, um, remembering all the things you do know, because even just you saying what is sort of some obvious fact to you in the scientific realm could be really impactful for someone to hear that's in the policy space and isn't sort of engaging with the content as much. So even just saying like some base level thing that's probably fairly obvious to an academic researcher can be really um, valuable in a policy setting where they're not engaging as closely to the, the technical knowledge.
All right. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I thought it was really phenomenal, but um, oh, I'll grab that. Uh, one of the things that was like really stood out to me was your slide um, when you were in like the Situation Room on Wolf Blitzer, because I could see on the bottom like the tagline for you was like about climate science denial, and then the two uh, sideboards were about um, COVID infection and death rates, and then also about Hurricane Sally. So I was looking at this image that was just like climate and climate related disasters, like plastered all over the slides. And so I was wondering, as someone who works in that space, for your own like mental health and your own sanity, how do you balance that sense of the fact that there's a very real urgency uh, behind your work with maintaining somewhat of a like a hopeful perspective? Um, that you will be able to affect real change. And then also, you know, again, staying like mentally healthy as someone who's in this very stressful scenario. Yeah, it's a really good question. And actually, I hadn't thought about that, but the Chiron is actually, it's, it's kind of like a finer uh, context in terms of all the things on the uh, screen at that moment. Yeah, I think um, a couple of things. I mean, one, I think in some ways I feel less susceptible to uh, the sense of dread and hopelessness of it because I I feel like I'm doing something to address it. And so that's like a really good outlet for doing it. So um, like when I first went into that field, I was sort of worried about that. Like, oh, is it just kind of hard because you, you, don't, you don't always get victories. You're just kind of like trying to tell, scream into the void about something. But, but, but I, I've actually um, felt kind of the opposite, that it just feels so impactful. Like I'm sort of less aware of the disaster because I'm just looking at it in terms of opportunities of, oh, we can infect that. We can help, you know, do that bill. I can talk to them about this. I can advance this work and lift up. It just feels more like I'm, I'm doing something actionable about it. So I, for me anyway, it feels sort of like less of a concern, but um, but you know, I think it is also just uh, keeping things in um, context. Like one thing I always try to do is um, kind of not sweat some of the personal stuff because I think there just tends to be sometimes like an over focus on like, am I using a plastic straw? And it's there's just like lots more bigger ways to affect change. So I think you like don't need to sweat it and do a lot of like personal guilt about your decisions in the same way if, if you can. Uh, work on uh, solving the more of the root problem than the bigger challenges associated with it. Thank you. Thank you. We can take the last question. I was wondering in the same vein as uh, Professor's question, has there ever been a time that you're familiar with when the data that was collected ended up changing the direction policymakers were taking? That's a good question. I think of a good example that's like uh, concise enough to, to uh, um, Yeah, I mean, I think one way that's happening now or has happened um, in recent memory is a lot of my work now is focusing on uh, decarbonizing the transportation sector. Um, and this is uh, a big issue because uh, we're trying to decarbonize everything, uh, but the way because we've had more success on the electrical sector side of things, it makes transportation a bigger part of the pie. So it's a bigger problem proportionally now to deal with transportation. Um, and so I, I think that's really forced us to start to look at, okay, what is the scale and what's, what are the bigger pieces of that to pull off and how are we going to get there with the different pieces. And so I think the data on that really informed the policy or where we prioritized first, right? So a lot of electrification EVs has been, that's been like the lowest hanging fruit as far as uh, getting us big changes real quick or quicker than you would get other things. And so that's been this huge, that was the huge priority in um, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, and a lot of investment has gone towards that. But now, because of that, we're, we're seeing, okay, we got to deal with all the other pieces, right? And what does it mean to deal with uh, decarbonizing rail and aviation? And what can we do to um, get people to shift modes or shift modes of transportation? Or uh, what do we do about industrial decarbonization? So now we're sort of, now that the data has sort of um, shown to the extent which those other things are problems, we've been able to really focus more on those other pieces that are kind of the harder to decarbonize sector. So um, I think that's one where uh, 
where the data really informed the decisions that were made about where investments would go and what, what's prioritized. Um, but yeah, it is a good uh, um, time and it definitely comes up a lot. I think especially on the, on the Hill, on Capitol Hill, because the bills, they're often looking, members of Congress are looking for ideas on what to cover. And so they'll look at what, what sort of is um, an issue, what's coming up, what are we sort of seeing in the data that shows something we need to tackle. And so um, I think it comes up in a lot of those contexts around environmental pollution and what pollutant to focus on and how to think about um, different ways is one example too. So we really appreciate you taking the time to present this wonderful lecture. Oh, I really enjoyed the guide to big problems and how you talked about being as proud of the Sheros on campus as your role in the Inflation Reduction Act. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, do we? Oh, do we? Are you? Oh, do we want to take some photos? I don't know. Are we? Okay. <laughs> um, well, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Goldman for her remarks today. They were really fantastic. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Amakuzi Kennedy and I discussed was uh, inviting speakers this year that were a little younger than some of the, the high lecture. Um, speakers that we've had in recent years, and uh, to demonstrate some of the impact that our, our more recent alums uh, have had. And I think Dr. Goldman delivered uh, uh, a really impactful talk on the, on the things that she's done in the science policy area. So thank you so much for that. Um, also, uh, she and I were talking earlier, and it, it struck me that we, we now have a little mini collection of uh, Hyatt lectures that focus on climate change and the role of, of engineers and uh, that engineers can play in, in that um, that topic and in the policy discussions around that and so forth. So if you're interested, uh, the very first uh, Hyatt lecture by Wayne Clough back in 2015 uh, is uh, available on our website and you can hear his thoughts that were really impacted by his time at the Smithsonian. And then more recently, uh, Rudy Bonaparte delivered uh, a lecture about three years ago, I think it was, also available on the website uh, talking about his thoughts about the interaction of engineering and, and climate change. So if you're interested in, in this topic, uh, please do take um, the time to look at those, those recordings.